the very generous introduction. Um, Vice Chancellor H.D. Karnatra, distinguished speakers, Professor Mohan Munasingha, Professor Yasuki Todo, and Dr. Linia Arianata, and Professor Dilshani Desanayake, chairperson of the annual research symposium and also members of the committee, and Professor Nenao Puniasuri, chairperson of the inauguration committee. And faculty members, esteemed researchers, ladies and gentlemen, and also friends, colleagues joining online. It is my deep honor to be invited as the chief guest and to speak to you in front of this very esteemed audience. I know University of Colombo has so much uh, to be proud of as the leading academic institution in the country. So I'm very deeply humbled to be here. I hope I'll be able to share something you don't know already. The theme of this year's symposium, Building a Sustainable Future Through Impactful Research, could not be timelier. So what would a sustainable future look like to all of us? This was at the heart of the recently concluded UN Summit for the Future, which produced the Pact for the Future as a North Star for the global community at the time of multiple crises. We in the UN believe that sustainability can only be achieved if we pursue a pathway that is inclusive, equitable, and environmentally sustainable. In other words, we strive towards a future that wholeheartedly embraces the entire set of 17 sustainable development goals as outlined in the Agenda 2030. We have less than six years to go before 2030, and we are at a critical juncture. The series of cascading crises we have witnessed since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, including the rising cost of living, ongoing conflicts, and growing energy demands, have collectively resulted in the first ever regression of the Human Development Index since its inception by UNDP in the 80s. The 2024 Global SDGs report highlighted that nearly half of the 17 targets are showing minimal or moderate progress, while over one third are stalled or going in reverse. None of the countries in our region, Asia and the Pacific, will achieve the whole set of the SDGs. An additional 23 million people were pushed into extreme poverty, and over 100 million people more were suffering from hunger in 2022 than 2019. On gender inequality, we noted that 55% of 120 surveyed countries lack laws prohibiting discrimination against women. While women are more educated than men in 60 plus countries surveyed, it would still require over 250 years for us to achieve gender equality in all areas of political, economic, and social participation. While the SDG attainment requires considerable investments, we have the challenge of financing, and Sri Lanka is no exception. The SDG investment gap in developing countries alone is four trillion US dollars a year. Many developing economies, including Sri Lanka, are faced with this daunting task of meeting the financing gap against the backdrop of debt crisis and shrinking physical space. The triple planetary crisis, pollution, biodiversity loss, and climate change adds further complications to this global landscape. We recently concluded the historic UN meeting on biodiversity to be followed by another one on climate change this month. Climate change is causing devastating natural disasters, we all know. Case in point is our recent past, the floods in Spain and typhoon in Taiwan, which is completely off cycle and unusually destructive. More than half a billion have been killed in climate-induced disasters since 2004. Another recent UN study launched this week said that in 2023, the Earth had accumulated the highest amount of carbon dioxide, 
mainly due to unusual forest fires we saw in North America, Europe, and Asia. If we continue with the business as usual scenario, we're very likely to experience up to a three degree Celsius warning before the end of this century. The chances of us staying within the Paris Agreement target of 1.5 degrees are fast disappearing. An unsettling issue for us, the humans, is that we really don't know exactly what would the three degrees warmer world look like. There is so much unknown and little preparation to be done. In other words, the well-being of the planet and the people are very much linked and therefore sustainability must be considered from both the perspectives of people and the planet. Here in Sri Lanka, while notable progress, particularly in the areas such as education, health, and access to clean water has been made, significant challenges remain in achieving the full spectrum of 2030 agenda goals. And many SDG indicators suffer from lack of data and evidence. So we don't really know the real picture. Urban poverty tripled and rural poverty doubled in 2022. We know why. Reaching 15% and 26% respectively. Sri Lanka is also now one of the most unequal countries in Asia, especially around the income wealth where the top 1% of Sri Lankans own 31% of the total personal wealth in the country, while the bottom 50% only less than 4%. And while it continues to be a high human development country, when it is adjusted for inequality, the HDI value drops almost by 20%. Additionally, progress on gender equality has been slow, with women and marginalized groups facing persistent barriers to economic participation and political representation. The economic crisis further exacerbated these issues as evident from the recent World Bank study, which said that women's labor force participation has dropped from 32% to 29%. And this is very worrisome because it means women are systematically left behind from the economic recovery activities including the booming tourism. We must deepen our understanding of the causes and decisively tackle them based on evidence and insights, which we don't have. Last year, to address the data gap in the country after pandemic and the economic crisis, UNDP worked with Oxford University to develop Sri Lanka's first multidimensional vulnerability index, or MVI. This MVI, assessed vulnerability in three critical dimensions, education, health, and disasters, and living standards, which are measured by 12 indicators. And we worked extensively with Sri Lankan academics and thinkers to ensure the selection of these indicators truly reflects the priorities of the people and the society. By calculating the deprivations encountered by each household, we learned that more than half of Sri Lankans can be considered as multidimensionally vulnerable. This means that these households are extremely vulnerable to any types of shocks, be it economic, social, or climatic. Households with a member of disability are more likely to be multidimensionally vulnerable than the household without. So what was useful about this MBI is that it allows us to take a deep dive into understanding the specifics of the communities. And for UNDP, it was extremely helpful because we understood that there were gaps in our outreach. For example, the Noel area district has the highest density of tea estates with most women engaged in lower ranks of employment, its plantations. And they had one of the highest NVIs. The district data also had a high prevalence of violence against women as evidenced from findings from UNDP social dialogues in the community. Then we realized that our interventions in this landscape are thin, very, very thin, and have, we have therefore progressively started working with others to build our portfolio around that community. So this is where evidence helps. 
Also, we understood that the lack of preparedness to disasters and household debt are primary contributions to vulnerabilities. This made us work decisively on a set of recommendations to the government to address some of the challenges on three particular topics. We know that Sri Lanka faces escalating climate vulnerability with intense rainfall events and rising temperatures threatening communities across the country. These climatic shift jeopardizes essential sectors, including agriculture, water resources, and biodiversity. The most recent climate modeling predicts by 2040, extreme rainfall events are expected to increase sharply, leading to more frequent and severe floods, especially in the dry and the intermediate zones. This will impact over a million people, damaging critical infrastructure than crops. Warmer temperatures, projected to rise by 1%, will bring increased heat stress, further reducing soil moisture, accelerating evaporation from reservoirs, and putting essential crops under threat. So can we now imagine what it would look like with a three degrees warmer climate? Sri Lanka, like many other developing countries, bear the brunt of climate impact despite its relatively small carbon footprint. Ensuring climate justice means holding larger polluting nations accountable while simultaneously supporting sustainable transitions in our own economies through targeted investments and research-driven solutions. The COVID pandemic has taught us that the time to contemplate the trade-off between sustainability and end growth is long gone. We must find an equilibrium amongst people, planet, and growth. In this era of interconnected global challenges, we must address multiple crises simultaneously. The nationally determined contributions, or NDCs, which articulate national ambitions and goals to contribute towards a shared vision outlined under the Paris Agreement, are at the heart of this effort. Sri Lanka's NDCs are ambitious, representing the pledge to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and adapt to the effects of climate change. But we must do more. We must raise the ambitions further, furthermore, because we have one degree, full one degree to shed before 2050. The NDCs are updated every five years, and the next NDC cycle to be presented at 2025 COP offers the opportunity. I would even say one and only opportunity to save our planet. While the private sector actors are increasingly playing a critical role in reducing carbon emissions by developing new technologies and mainstream sustainability in their own business operations, they often lack knowledge and expertise as to how to measure and validate their contributions toward those national global commitments. And this has significant implications for carbon trade and other new investments coming in to ensure the whole of the global community approach. Without data and evidence, we are prevented from making bold and impactful investments while also missing out on opportunities for strategic collaboration in terms of research and development. In the context of shrinking physical space and increasing complexity, it is crucial that we make the most efficient use of our resources across society, public, and private financing. Research plays a pivotal role here by providing the evidence base and insights necessary to drive impactful policies and actions. And we must leverage our collective knowledge to devise integrated solutions that address these crises holistically while hosting both human development and environment stewardship. At the same time, for the fruits of the growth to be sustainable, we must ensure that no one is left behind and that the fruits are evenly shared amongst the stakeholders. Inequal societies are bound to experience disturbances and instability, which are hurtful to economic development. As is the case with the SDGs, development challenges and solutions are all interconnected, transcending a single sector or institution. Therefore, transdisciplinary research plays an essential role in this endeavor. 
By crossing traditional disciplinary barriers, it integrates knowledge from diverse fields such as environment science, economic social policy, and gender analysis to create a comprehensive set of solutions to global complex challenges. One example is that we all know that the impact of climate change affects women and men differently due to their gendered roles and norms in the society. While some researchers exist, we do not have effective tools to systematically mainstream gender considerations in our climate action and responses due to lack of data. The goal five on gender equality in Sri Lanka is not measurable due to the severe lack of data. And this is where interdisciplinary research that investigates the intersection between gender and climate could perhaps be essential. Also, we must understand the needs of young people and work with them to amplify their voices in climate justice. We must be more progressive in supporting youth-led climate initiatives, education, and advocacy to ensure that next generation is equipped with drive equitable climate solutions, and they can create a future where they can have hope. UNDP recently did the world's first climate survey it says that close to 80% of young people thought that their leaders are not doing enough. They want to be part of the solution, but they don't know how. And the universities can be the platform to make their dreams come true. And universities and academic institutions are uniquely positioned to lead the effort in fulfilling knowledge gaps by providing a platform where researchers, policymakers, and communities can collaborate on innovative, inclusive solutions, and also giving the opportunity to young people to be part of the solution. For example, the UN report launched last week during the COP on biodiversity showed that one third of the tree species are in danger of disappearing. While we often speak about mammals and amphibians disappearing from a planet, we forget about the tree species that provide the foundational ecosystem for all of us to survive. This type of massive global research was only possible because over 1,000 tree specialists across, across the world got together to map species to produce alarming evidence calling for urgent action. So this is an example of researchers united in action to make such a large-scale study possible. The role of academic is not only to generate knowledge, but also to ensure that research translates into actionable, context-specific solutions that benefit society. This is where the application becomes so important. At UNDP, we have always advocated for the integration of research into policy and decision-making processes. UNDP is currently supporting the government in developing its first biennial transparency report for the Paris Agreement, which includes national inventory reports, tracking progress towards the NDCs, policies and measures, climate impacts and adaptation, level of financial and technology support, and capacity building needs. This prioritizes inclusive participation, fair distribution of climate action benefits, and just transition principles that would benefit everyone equally. The findings would directly influence the preparation of the next generation of NDC. So it's really the responsibility of a practitioner in institution like UNDP to make sure research actually get applied and operationalized in action. Our work also centers around empowering communities disproportionately impacted by climate change, including low-income populations, indigenous communities, and women. So we do work a lot on the grounds in testing some of the prototypes and ideas and research on the ground. Academic institutions, such as the University of Colombo, are key to all of the areas I just mentioned. I commend the university for establishing a research committee focusing exclusively on the SDGs, particularly in areas that support inclusive green growth and climate resilience. Your commitment to interdisciplinary collaboration and impact for research is a critical component of our shared vision to promote sustainable development, inclusive growth, and social justice. And ultimately, it's all about our responsibility to create a future where every one of us can have hope. UNDP is deeply honored to be a partner in this 
transformative journey, and we very much look forward to working closely with University of Colombo in taking forward. And all the best with the rest of the program, and I look forward to learning from all the distinguished speakers to make sure that UNDP stays relevant and useful for national endeavors. Once again, thank you so much for the invitation.